Okay, Senator, uh, I'm going to start uh, letting folks in. Okay. You guys all ready? Let's go. Um, aloha, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're just going to wait maybe about a minute or two um, as folks start to row in, um, and we'll get started shortly. Thank you. Aloha, Jacob. Sounded like Hi, Auntie Kella. How are you doing? I'm good. How about you? Good. Nice Hi, Gil. Aloha. Jacob, this is Auntie Renee from Koala Aloha. How are you doing? Good. Nice, nice to see you. <laughs> oh, you too. So am I going to see you on Saturday? Yes, you'll see me. All right. Aloha, Gil. Sean. Aloha. Leaving. Aloha Gil, Aloha, it's TJ. Everybody. Aloha Kella, how are you? It's TJ. Hello. Aloha Mai. Oh, okay, how are you? <laughs> oh my god. Oh, long time no here. Oh, oh. Sorry, I got grandma duties tonight, so I'm not going to put my video on, but I'm right here. He's okay. Getting Kella. <laughs> going Aloha, kindergarten everyone. in the fall. Uh, it's uh, 6 32 p.m. Um, and to be respectful of everyone's time, we are going to get started. Um, but before we start with the introduction of our elected officials, uh, we're just going to go over some of the Zoom ground rules. I'm sure many of you are uh, very familiar with these type of Zoom uh, meetings. Um, but we're going to ask that uh, if you're not speaking, uh, to please put yourself on mute uh, so we don't receive any feedback. Uh, we have over 80 people registered for tonight's town hall. Um, so we're going to have a question and answer period. Um, and to make sure that we get everyone's question um, and to make sure that we stay on time. If you do have a question for our presenters um, and our elected officials, uh, please make uh, please put your question or comment in the chat. Uh, we have our uh, legislative staff um, who is monitoring the uh, chat both here on the Zoom call and on Facebook, um, and we're going to try to make sure that we get through all of your questions. Um, so um, I think we are ready. Um, and before we uh, formally begin, I wanted to um, introduce uh, our um, elected officials tonight. Uh, tonight, we have Senator Gil R uh, Riviere, uh, Representative Sean Quinlan, as well as Council Member Heidi Suneyoshi, uh, people you are very familiar with um, and they've worked uh, very hard to put tonight's uh, program together. Um, so now I'll hand the floor off to Senator Revere uh, for some remarks um, and we'll get this show on the road. Thank you. Thank Senator. you and, and, and uh, mahalo to everybody for tuning in tonight for this presentation with me, Rep uh, Quinlan, um, Council Member Tsuniyoshi. We thought that um, due to the circumstances of what has just occurred, um, with the flooding that we thought that we would put the emphasis of this meeting on flooding, flooding response, uh, flooding recovery. And we know there will be a lot of questions on that. So we are very, um, we're very grateful that tonight we have people from both city and state agencies. Um, and in order of speaking, I'm, I'm gonna get out of the way real quick here so we can get on to the business. But we have Carol Tiao Beam and she's gonna talk, uh, she's with the National Flood Insurance Program so she's going to mention a little bit about the, the guidelines and parameters and what's important uh, regarding flood insurance. Um, we have a gentleman named uh, Roger Babcock. He's going to talk. He's from the city. And he's going to talk about stream clearance and maintenance uh, considerations for the city. And uh, Hiro Toya, he's the Oahu Emergency Management Director, and he's going to speak uh, in more detail about uh, um, you know the response and whatnot. 
And Luke Myers is with the Hawaii Emergency Management uh, Agency. So we're gonna let them speak uh, maybe five, 10 minutes each uh, with their section of the presentation. Then we're gonna have a, a question and answer for you. And remember, use the chat um, and or Facebook comments if you're watching on Facebook. And, and we'll try to feed those to Jacob. Jacob's gonna run the meeting from here on. And then um, presuming that we have uh, any time left at that point, um, uh, Rep and council member and I can uh, each maybe give a few uh, brief updates about what's happening at the legislature that we would normally get. So with that in mind, thank you for being here tonight and I'll turn the floor back over to Jacob to moderate our uh, presenters. Thank you. Um, so up first, uh, we have um, Carol. Carol, are you on? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Carol. Great. There, we see you. Floor is yours. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Senator, for uh, having me tonight. So I'm actually a neighbor. I am a, a longtime Windward resident. I have born and raised in uh, the Ahoy Manu area. And um, I still live probably like five minutes from, from, my, from my childhood home, raising my family. So this, you know, this really hits home for me because, um, you know, we love living on the windward side, but we also know that it's also very rainy. And these recent rains at the beginning of the month was very, very devastating. I, um, you know, saw a lot of drone video uh, and I know uh, that it has impacted a lot of folks. Um, so again, my name is Carol Tialbeam. I'm with the Department of Land and Natural Resources, and I'm the State National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator. So long title, but let me just kind of explain what my role is. What I do is I work uh, with FEMA as a liaison between FEMA and the local communities when they administer the program, the National Flood Insurance Program, with respect to development in floodplains. However, it's very closely tied to the flood insurance side of the house um, and it goes together. So what I wanted to do, because this program is very complex and it would take much more than five to 10 minutes to talk about it, I wanna just kind of go over some misconceptions about flood insurance. So, you know, a lot of times I hear people say, you know, I can't get flood insurance because I don't, I don't live in a flood zone. Well, actually, everybody lives in a flood zone. It just depends on your writ. Um, you are eligible because all of your counties and the city and county of Honolulu is a participating community in the National Flood Insurance Program. So flood insurance is available regardless of the zone. If you're high risk and you have a mortgage, a federally backed mortgage, then your lender would require you to have flood insurance. But if you don't have a mortgage and you paid off your mortgage, you should still consider maintaining flood insurance because although the mandatory requirement goes away, the risk doesn't. So that's something to think about. And I know, you know, finances is always something to consider, but just remember that the risk is still there. Um, when I looked at this, this event um, and I got some statistics from FEMA on the number of claims that have been filed to date. And Jacob, did you say I could share my screen or you're gonna put up? No, um, you up? should have the ability to share screen. Okay, let me see if I can do this. Screen one, is that my main screen? You should okay. be able to see, yeah. What do you see? Okay. On. Can you guys see that map here? Um, I can't see anything right now. It says you started to screen share, but it's a blank screen. Really? Hmm. What? Do you see anything? No, I don't. Anybody else see anything? Here. No, it's just pulling. Huh. Jacob, you can't pull it up on. Oh, here. Never mind. I got something here. How about that? Can you see this? 
No. No. I can't. Oh. Darn. Okay. Well, I guess I'm not so good at this. Um. Well, what that map that I wanted to show you. Um. Let me pull it up. Um. And I, and I'll I'll have that available and I'll put it up on our website. But uh, what I have a map of Oahu and it was of, of our windward shore our coastline. And uh, all the by zip codes, the number of policies uh, that are enforced, and then the number of claims that were for Oahu, there was only like 70 claims that were made. But of those 70 claims, 30% were in what we call low to moderate risk. So it's an F zone. It's a zone that you would not. Senator is sharing it now, sorry. Oh, Carol, are you still there? Did I unshare it now? Yes, I think we might have lost her. Oh no. I know her connection bar was uh, yellow, so. Yeah, if you can un uh, unshare, uh, Senator. Yeah. Um, how do I? <laughs> OK, unshare. Uh, just press it again? Yeah, you can go unshare. Where's the? Uh... Dang, I am sorry. No, you're good. We're all learning uh, to use this. Um, oh, God. There we go. Really? Okay. Um, you know what? Uh, maybe uh, if Carol comes back, uh, we can go back to her. Um, uh, maybe we'll go with uh, Ro Roger. Um, I know uh, Roger was going to talk to us about some stream clearance protocols. Uh, maybe we'll go straight to Roger. And if Carol comes back, oh, speaking of Carol, um, she just returned. Let's see. Carol, are you back? Carol, you there? Oh, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just just uh, just say that. The number of policy uh, claims that have come in uh, have been really low. There, like I said, 70, um, about 79 uh, claims have come in. 30% of them are in areas that are in a low to moderate risk zone. So an area that a lender would typically would not mandate, so it would be voluntary. So for those, for those folks, those 30% that chose to buy flood insurance, they're very lucky because they all have coverage because uh, homeowners insurance typically doesn't cover for flood. Uh, one of the other things, uh, misconceptions, is that people think that flood insurance, um, they don't need it because they're going to get disaster assistance. Well, first, you need to have a federal declaration to do that. And most times, that uh, assistance will come in the form of a, a loan, a small business administration loan, uh, which you have to pay back. And you have to be credit worthy uh, to be able to to get that uh, SBA loan. And then the other thing um, I've heard and I've seen before, uh, sadly, is that folks think that they don't need flood insurance because their mortgage, you know, they paid off their mortgage. And actually I heard someone tell me in the Haleiwa area in the floods back in, I don't know if it was 2008, um, that she said that her insurance agent told her that she didn't need it anymore because she paid off her mortgage. Unfortunately, three months later, uh, she got flooded in, a, in another big flood in, in Haleiwa. And so um, that is not the case. I mean, you are still at risk just because you paid off your mortgage. It's not, it's not um, something that you should um, drop if you can. Hurricane season is coming up. I would really uh, try to think about flood insurance. Uh, go to floodsmart.gov 
to find out more information. There is a typical 30 day wait. There's a few exceptions where it would be uh, effective immediately, but if you were to buy it tomorrow, you'd have to wait 30 days before it goes into effect. And then we cross our fingers that, you know, we don't have another um, event come through in the next uh, 30 days. So that's something that you should really pay attention to. I don't want to uh, take up any more time, but uh, if you visit our website, Waihalana, W-A-I-H-A-L-A-N-A dot org, and I post a whole bunch of um, information uh, uh, on flood insurance, on developing in the floodplain, the flood map, how to look up your flood zone. So you should uh, always check that because maps change uh, from time to time. So you can also sign up for our subscription. We have a blog. Um, all I need is your your name and your email address, nothing, no social security or anything like that. And, and you'll get updates um, as frequent as we post them. And um, that's all I wanna, I don't wanna uh, get off track here. Maybe we you know I'll wait for questions um, at the end. If anyone has questions about flood insurance, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. And, and yes, if you do have any questions for Carol, um, you can ask it uh, during our Q&A period, uh, which is going to be uh, after all of the presenters have gone. Uh, up next, uh, I'm going to call upon Roger Babcock uh, from the City Department of Facility and um, Facility Maintenance uh, to talk about stream clearance. Uh, Roger, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, my name is Roger Babcock. I'm Chief Engineer and Director for the Department of Facility Maintenance for the city. And we're the agency um, in charge of uh, maintaining uh, a lot of things, including streams. Uh, so we have, we have roads and storm sewers and light, street lights and public buildings and the storm water uh, system, including uh, stream maintenance. So we, um, we have a web page um, where you can get lots of information. Hopefully, my screen will share here. This is our Department of Facility Maintenance uh, web page part of it, which is about stream maintenance. And it's um, honolulu.gov slash DFM, Department of Facility Maintenance slash clean stream. And it has information about uh, our program, including our stream maintenance permit. So in order to do activity in a stream, in order to maintain it, essentially to bring equipment into a stream, in order to do things like remove sediment, remove um, uh, growth and, and things like that and have people in there and, and doing maintenance, we have to have a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. They control, control all waterways in the United States. And <clears throat> we have a permit for to enter 92 different uh, pieces of streams uh, on the island. And it turns out that that is really a small fraction of the streams on Oahu. One of the, uh, if you open this, um, this link here that says stream maintenance um, project plans, uh, you'll find that <clears throat> it shows you, it has maps that show you all the streams that we maintain. And I'll see if this will appear here. Um, can you see the map of Oahu with a bunch of stream lines on it? Hopefully you can. Um, all of the green things there are streams, <clears throat> but only the ones that are colored in blue do we have permits for. So the rest of the streams are privately owned or in conservation areas. Uh, a lot of the ones along the North Shore there, those are all stream mouth openings. Um, if you scroll down, <clears throat> you can, it's broken down by district. So for example, here you can see in East Honolulu, Central, uh, um, uh, downtown through East Honolulu, you can see some of the streams that we have permits to maintain. And many times that it's only part of the stream. It doesn't go all the way up into the mountains or necessarily all the way down to the ocean. Um, <clears throat> here's in the uh, uh, Ko'olau, Loa or Ko'olau Poco area or uh, um, uh, 
here's uh, Kailua area. We have a few streams there. North Shore, none of those streams up there on the, on the tip. It's just these few stream outlets here. And you see many other streams here that um, we don't have anything to do with. And then here's in the Pearl Harbor and, and other areas. So we have um, the ability, we have the ability and we, and we do uh, maintain streams, which involves cutting, cutting overgrowth, uh, removal of trash and uh, removal, occasionally removal dredging of, of sediments and stuff that have accumulated. And this is a, um, uh, you know, just one of our tasks, but it's a, it's a very large task. And we have um, um, not too many folks dedicated to this activity, but uh, they, we do have um, 14 people that work on stream um, maintenance on a, on a continuous basis. And they work on streams and it takes them um, a couple of weeks, generally, depending on the length of the stream reach to, to complete um, some maintenance. And uh, recently they're working in, in Kalihi stream, which is, um, takes about two to three weeks. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a section from basically from King Street uh, down to where there's, where, where do you get to uh, standing water that's, where, that's tidally influenced and can't really go in the streams then where, where there's water uh, all the time. And so this kind of work involves heavy equipment. You have to have a crane to put put um, equipment in there, like the loaders and uh, and, and uh, bobcats and things, where so that you can uh, gather up materials. And then you have to push it to the nearest uh, overpass. And then we have a crane with bucket list lift to put load things out into a dump truck, etc. Um, so it's a it's a very laborious and and uh, um, time-consuming uh, process. And so it's quite difficult to get to uh, all of the streams um, on, a, on a regular basis, but um, we, we, we try to address uh, the most problem areas. Um, and as, we, as, as well as we can. Um, so I'll stop sharing that. Um, we have... Um, so, so we generally only can work in streams that we own, that the city owns. Um, and many streams are owned by either privately or by um, large, land, large landowners, or they're owned by the state, or they're privately owned. Many streams are privately owned where the stream runs through a piece of someone's property, and then that stream belongs to them. And uh, also the ownership of a stream that goes under a bridge uh, if it's a county road, then the county, us, are responsible for maintaining under that bridge. But if it goes under a, a state highway, which all, all streams that enter the ocean do cross a state highway uh, of, at one point or another, uh, the area underneath that bridge is the, main, is the responsibility of the state uh, Department of Transportation. So if you, look, if you wanna look through all those maps, you can see all the ownership of, of the different um, streams and, and uh, more or less who's, who's responsible for them. Um, so I think maybe I'll leave it at that for, the, you know, for an introduction and be happy to take questions later. Thank, thank you, yes, uh, we are getting uh, a few questions for you. Um, so we will ask those uh, at the end. Um, up next, we'll go to uh, Hiro Toya, who is the, uh, Director of the Department of Emergency Management at the City and County. Um, Hiro, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you Jacob. And uh, thank you, Senator Rivera, for inviting me to this uh, forum. Um, it's really a, a privilege to have this opportunity to speak to the community. Um, so um, I, I know there was um, a, a request to talk about um, some of the uh, public information and the alert and war warning process, as well as the uh, emergency response um, that government side has. So let me talk a, about, a little bit about those. And then I'll uh, tag team off to um, Administrator Luke Myers from the uh, Hawaii Emergency Management Agency to talk about the, uh, the state perspective on that. Um, so generally when it comes to, um, uh, to weather events, um, National Weather Service is of course our authority here. Um, they would issue forecasts. Um, and if there is a uh, alert that needs to go out, um, they would issue that through multiple channels. 
And uh, depending on how serious that event is, um, they could be using the, uh, the NOAA weather radio. Um, I think some of you might be familiar with that. Um, and then uh, depending on the, the level of the emergency, um, they could be issuing an emergency alert over TV and radio. So those are the other uh, crawlers that go across um, that's accompanied by the tone. Um, if it's a really big emergency, they may actually use the uh, what's called the wireless emergency alert. So that's the cell phone alert that you can't turn off um, that goes off. Um, uh, to notify people of the emergency. So um, our role um, at the Department of Emergency Management is to uh, amplify those messages and um, also, also, if needed, uh, provide any additional instructions during an emergency. Um, so in the instance of the flooding that happened um, the week of um, uh, a few weeks ago earlier this month, um, Weather Service issued a, a flood watch uh, on March 8th. So that was actually the day before the, um, the, the heavy rain event. And so that flood watch means um, be prepared. Uh, conditions are favorable to flooding. So, so be prepared, um, be aware of your surroundings and uh, be prepared to take action. Uh, so that was the eighth. Um, and then the following day, March 9th, of course, um, uh, early in the morning, we went into a flood advisory, which means that there's uh, rain happening um, and there's you know some nuisance flooding. Maybe there's a little bit of ponding going on, but not a serious emergency. So that was at um, 5.02 AM. Uh, well. It, about um, three hours later, um, the, the rain had escalated and uh, the flooding had actually started to be observed in the community. So um, the weather service upgraded to a flash flood warning. Um, so, you know, for both of those instances, uh, actually throughout the watch, the advisory and the warning, um, my department's actually trying to amplify that message to get it uh, out into the community. So um, we use a, a system called h &L Info, so you get an um, alert on your phone saying that there's a, a, a flooding event happening. So um, we have different actions based on the uh, different levels of those um, alerts that come out from the weather service. So what happens at the uh, flash flood watch level is that um, uh, we would issue an alert out to all the city departments saying, hey, uh, flood watch, um, so be prepared to take uh, emergency action if needed. Um, so then at the time that the, uh, the flash flood warning is issued, then we uh, activate what's called our emergency operation center. So that's, that's the coordination center for the city and county uh, whenever there's a large scale emergency. Um, so what we do at the warning level is we bring in um, some of our key agencies so that we can coordinate our responses a little bit better. So that includes our uh, first responders, um, our public works agencies like uh, Rogers department, um, and uh, our parks and rec department, they actually have people with uh, big chainsaws that can help cut down trees if there's a, um, a tree blocking um, public right of way. Um, and then we bring in our uh, transportation folks. Um, so the bus um, and the roadway folks so that um, if there's impacts to transportation, then um, we can quickly coordinate any actions that we need to. So, you know, during this whole time, um, first responders will continue to uh, respond to 911 calls. And that's what they did on, on March 9th. Um, but at the Emergency Operations Center, what we do is we try to lean forward a little bit to anticipate needs. Um, so one of the things that was happening was as the flooding was escalating that day, um, we knew that um, uh, the flooding was pretty bad in some areas to the point that, you know, even the firefighters couldn't get in on in their normal fire engines. So we're trying to come up with contingency plans. Okay, what if we need to go into a, a more complicated rescue scenario? Um, air wasn't really an option either because of the bad weather. Um, so actually, uh, Rogers Department uh, deployed a, a large dump truck, um, just trying to come up with creative solutions so that if, if um, search and rescue needed to happen in a more complicated situation with um, high uh, levels of water, we had some resources to assist in that response. Um, so during that same time, you know, we're also trying to establish uh, temporary refuge areas for people who couldn't get, get home. We weren't quite ready to establish shelters, but you know, if um, people are stuck in traffic, they got to go use the restroom or they want to park somewhere. Um, so we work with the department of education to make that happen. Um, so of course, um, uh, things escalated throughout the day and we actually didn't get out of the flash flood warning uh, on, on that day until midnight. Um, and, um, and then of course, you, you know about what happened in uh, Haleiwa. We actually had a, a pretty bad flash flood emergency there where we had to evacuate people. Um, so that's um, you know sort of what happens uh, uh, and um, by no means, this isn't a typical EOC activation for us. You know, this was definitely a higher level uh, emergency than um, we were used to encountering. Um, but uh, we continued that posture. We actually stayed in the flash flood watch for a number of days after that. 
Um, we went into a flash flood warning several times, uh, and I think you folks are well aware of how much rain the windward side got, not only on the 9th, but um, we had a flood warning on the 10th, which resulted in that landslide on Kamehameha Highway by Kualoa Ranch. Um, again, on the 11th, the 12th, um, and then we had a little respite over the weekend, and then back again on Monday, uh, we had another flash flood warning. So um, for our response, that sort of delayed some of our actions, um, but what we did end up doing was um, work with uh, uh, not only Rogers Department, but with um, environmental services uh, to, to try to create some more allowances for um, uh, debris drop off at the transfer stations. Um, we weren't able to start the sweeps until the following week. On the 15th, we started up with um, extra bulky trash pickup um, and also included, um, and we didn't advertise this widely, but you know, people who had um, mud and rocks and things like that, the transfer stations can't accept those because they have to take their waste over to uh, H power. Uh, but um, we have another department that was actually going out with uh, heavy equipment to do the pickup from curbside. So here's one of our challenges. Um, we are not authorized or resourced to go into private property to do debris cleanup. Um, so I think that might've been a point of frustration for some people in the community that like, why isn't the government doing more to help um, on at, at their property? And we just um, don't have the authority or the resources to do something like that. But what we can do is to pick up uh, debris from curbside. Um, so we try to communicate in a targeted way as much as possible um, to, to make that happen. Um, so to, to tell people that, hey, you can uh, push your bulky trash and debris out the curbside and the city will come pick it up. Um, the other thing that happens almost concurrently to that is our damage assessment process. So um, because of the continuing rains, we had to delay the process a little bit, but um, we launched the, uh, the online portal for uh, reporting damages um, to us uh, pretty much right away. The following day was up and running. Um, so thank you to those of you that, um, um, I'm sorry for the damages that you incurred, but thank you for the, the reporting that you um, sent to us. Um, that actually helps us uh, inform where we need to send additional crews out for uh, further assessments, um, which occurred that first weekend and into the following week. Um, and that ultimately resulted in a joint assessment with uh, FEMA on uh, last week, Monday, March 22nd. So we were able to get to this um, joint assessment with FEMA relatively quickly because of um, all the reporting that happened from the community. So. Um, the other things that we do with that information, we don't just collect that information for the sake of FEMA um, or for federal assistance. That is certainly one of the reasons why we do that. Um, but one of the other uses for that is um, uh, more targeting from our debris management teams um, for our bulky trash guys. They can better target the community um, rather than having to uh, drive around and, uh, and look for, for debris. They, they know what properties um, incur damage so they can actually uh, increase their presence in those communities. Um, we also share that with our Department of Planning and Permitting so that if um, there's a future permitting requirement for uh, folks to do repairs, um, the, the, the department is aware of those. Um, we're also working with the, uh, the Department of um, Budget and Fiscal Services um, to see if there's something we can do about um, real property tax relief for those who are affected. Um, so that's another agency we share information with. And of course, we share the information about damages to the community with nonprofits um, such as Salvation Army and Red Cross so they can better target their assistance. Um, another agency that we did share the information is with, is with the State Department of Human Services. Um, they run the SNAP program. Um, so in order for them to better target additional relief for uh, beneficiaries of SNAP, um, we provided the damage assessment data that, so that they can better inform their decisions. So, um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, this is, um, we always say uh, emergency response and disaster response is a whole community effort. And that's exactly what we see um, time after time. And uh, of course, there's limits to what government can do. Um, but uh, you know, we, we uh, do as much as we can under our authorities to provide the relief that the community needs. So um, I'll, I'll stop there and then um, hand off to, uh, to Administrator Myers from uh, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Good evening, uh, my name is Luke Myers. I am the Administrator at the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, Senator, to share the role of state emergency management. And I think as Hiro said, it, it's, it's been a unified response from the beginning. Uh, state emergency management's role uh, in any incident is to support our counties. We actually started the day before on March 8th. I think one of the markers of this incident, um, many of the flooding incidents that we see in Hawaii are very flashy in nature. 
And this was one of those type of incidents. On Maui, we saw 13 inches of rain in 24 hours on the 8th. On Oahu, we had some rain gauges up above you all that had close to 20 inches of rain in 24 hours. Obviously, with the very kind of short nature of some of our watersheds, uh, they do respond and they do send uh, a lot of water down those. Uh, we also looked at the larger picture with Kauai, uh, with the isolation that went on in the North Shore and Hanalei. So from a state emergency management perspective, we support the counties. We, we work with the state agencies that provide operations. In particular, uh, for the flooding on the North Shore and the Windward side, uh, as Hero had mentioned, there were numerous uh, flood advisory watches and warnings. And I think one of the, the real challenges and messages that we wanna to promote to you all tonight is uh, really get to know the hazards that you all face. I think in going out several times in the last two or three weeks with some of the federal officials and some of our state and county partners is that we, we have a lot of good uh, knowledge from the, the residents in these areas. And I think it's important to really document that as much as possible. What we did see with this type of flooding, it was very flashy in nature. It came through very fast uh, and it came through uh, with a lot of debris. Uh, some of the others have touched on uh, some of the potential maintenance and cleaning of those watersheds. From a state perspective, uh, there is opportunity under state law in life-threatening situations to enter on the state property. Uh, it has to be for imminent life safety issues to remove debris. We have seen this in other floods. I, I think in the, the nature of the flooding that we saw in this situation, um, we never got a specific request to uh, go out there. Uh, the other thing that we saw as Hero and the others have mentioned, we had prolonged rains in this incident. So on top of the very short fuse nature of the 24 hour floods that we coordinated with the National Weather Service and supporting pushing those alert and warnings, we had multiple days of rain on top of uh, that initial surge. Uh, this did cause a, a little bit of a delay in getting out and assessing some of the damages. Uh, from a state emergency management perspective, once we start to get those initial reports, we do work with the counties. On the city and county, as, as Hero mentioned, we did a joint preliminary damage assessment on March the 22nd with a federal, state, and local team. And we saw about 93 properties on the windward side and the North shore of Oahu. We saw a, a mix of damages. Uh, some of you submitted information and we really appreciate that uh, understanding the, the loss that some of you have been through. Uh, it helps tell a story to potentially get some federal assistance uh, down the road. This may be in the form of federal grants from FEMA's individual assistance program or potentially uh, SBA, uh, Small Business Administration, uh, low interest loans. Um, we look at any incident where there's potential federal assistance and uh, it's not a fix all, it does not cover all of the losses, um, all any of the potential uh, impacts that you all have in the community. I think one of the main things that we've seen uh, in the Windward side and the North Shore there's a real sense of resiliency in the individuals that live there. Um, and uh, being out this past weekend again, uh, we saw many homeowners and businesses actually restoring their properties and uh, moving into short-term recovery. As of this point in time, we are still uh, going through the validation of the damaged impacts that have been submitted by uh, several of the counties, including Maui, Oahu, and Kauai. Uh, specifically on Oahu, uh, we hope to be packaging up this information uh, and potentially submitting it as a major disaster declaration request. Uh, this is not a, uh, a very quick process. It, it can take uh, several weeks, if longer sometimes, to uh, have this paperwork go through. And so one of the things in working with the city and county, we have uh, many uh, voluntary uh, organizations that are active in disasters. They're called BOAD, and some of you have already experienced uh, their wonderful sense of, uh, of sharing and, and helping out in the community. Those unmet needs that are showing up in the community, if they work their way to state emergency management through the VOAD, 
uh, we make sure that information is shared either back with uh, the Salvation Army or with the city and county. So we would ask you all in this situation as some of the others, uh, one, to document your damages as thoroughly as possible. Obviously, it's, it's, been, it's been a few weeks, so uh, you want to get things cleaned up. As Carol had pointed out, uh, one of the strongest forms of mitigation or preven prevention that we can take as a community, especially living in an island community, uh, is having flood insurance. Uh, there's tremendous value of the flood insurance program. Again, it's not going to cover everything that you may have. Uh, but at least will provide you an opportunity to recover some of your losses. As we move forward in the next several weeks, we will continue to work with uh, Maui, Kauai, and Oahu specifically on their damages. And uh, we hope to be reporting back sometime in the next two or three weeks on a potential uh, request for further federal assistance. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Luke. Um, also want to thank um, Carol, Hero, and Roger for their presentations. Um, I know we have a lot of questions um, that have uh, been put into the chat. Uh, we've tried our best to compile them. Um, so if we do miss them, please point them out or, or type them um, again in the chat. Um, but we're going to go in order of the presenters. Um, so I know, um, let's see. Um, I know Roger had a lot of questions uh, during his uh, presentation. Um, so Roger, if we can call you up to the stage um, and we'll try to go through the uh, questions that were asked. Um, the first question is from Carlos. Carlos asked, um, how often are the streams being inspected? The, uh, um, by uh, by ordinance, we we're supposed to inspect uh, all um, hardened uh, streams every year, and other streams every two years. Okay, thanks. Um, and then um, let's see. Uh, you know, there were a lot of questions about preventative maintenance. Um, and a lot of people had questions about, you know, there, they, there were obviously uh, many streams and many areas that had a lot of uh, debris in the waterway uh, prior to the storm. Um, can you talk about uh, maybe some of those uh, preventative uh, measure actions that uh, you folks uh, have in the queue, uh, you know, or if um, there were any lessons learned about, you know, how maybe we can better, um, you know, manage uh, you know many of these uh places prior to big storms yeah that's a good question and i also saw uh some questions about how maybe a, a community groups or something could get involved and we do have an adopt a stream program uh which is very active unfortunately we can only have you adopt streams that, that we own um we can't have you adopt streams on private property. You know, I'll go back and share. There was also a question about Hale Eva. You know, if I share that that page um, for the uh, Hale Eva area, you know, this is, there's a lot of streams there. And the only place we have access to is uh, Paukawila stream where it crosses Hale Eva road. So we're responsible for the maintenance underneath that bridge and 10 feet on each side, Malka and Mackay. But no other part of any other stream in the North Shore area do we own or are we authorized to maintain, right? That, so that's all the streams. You just see that one little blue dot. That's the only thing we own. Um, and so, you know, in a general sense, we, we really can't use tax, city taxpayer money to maintain um, somebody else's stream. So these are all, Privately owned by large landowners and or the and or the state, so um, <clears throat> preventative maintenance is of course important um, ahead of a ahead of a storm or or all the time, uh, but it it basically has to um, it has to fall to figuring out um, you know who who the owner is and then having them you know trying to get them to either maintain it themselves or to um, to, uh, to let a community group or association uh, do that. Um, a, a good way to, to organize those things um, would be through um, 
I, I suppose through council members, you know, in your in your district, uh, they could perhaps organize that. Uh, we work with them to do trash cleanups and other other things like that. But um, in general, we we can't go into the to the streams um, of of private property, same as we can't go onto your own private property and and sort of clean up your yard for you or something. And, you know, I know um, in reading through the chat, uh, you know, there were, um, you know, a lot of, I guess, frustration from folks uh, who have maybe tried to report, um, you know, down trees or a blockage, um, you know, in the community and they have uh, reported to the city. Um, you know, if, if reports have been filed and, you know, action hasn't been taken in a few months, what do you recommend to those uh community members because I know some of the frustration is that they do report these things uh, via the 311 app and you know um, but you know it definitely does take time is there a, a follow-up mechanism or what do you uh, recommend to folks uh, well the the city is responsible for getting back to folks who um, leave you know leave contact information um, and we I believe fairly quickly we'll research whether it, in in the situation where it's requesting uh, you know something specific to a specific location, then we would get back to them um, if um, if it was not our property, then we would let them know that. Or if uh, it is, then we would schedule um, as soon as possible um, for uh, activity to, uh, to, uh, to to happen appropriate appropriate measures. Um, the, um, I, I assume, yeah, there was a report of a tree that fell into a, a, a stream. Um, and that's, a, that's a concern. Um, and I'm pretty sure that if it was one of our streams that we that we would have been there to to remove it. Um, this question may or may not um, be for you, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, Anyway, um, you know, there's also a lot of frustration regarding uh, private landowners who may not take responsibility, you know, for uh, waterways or properties that fall under their jurisdiction. Uh, is there anything that can be done, um, fines uh, or anything like that? Um, I know this may not be a question for you, and this may be something for uh, the council member or even um, our state uh, senator or rep, um, but just wanted to just ask it anyway yeah so that that's a good question and um the city ordinances uh do allow the city to um to um document uh request action and even levy fines against private stream owners um, who don't properly maintain their streams um, so that's like a stream police force. Um, unfortunately, we, you know, that is allowed by, by statute, by ordinance. Uh, however, we really don't have um, manpower. <laughs> if you look at that, uh, those maps that we saw you, there's, I don't know, maybe a thousand streams or something, uh, a lot of them, and uh, they're, they're all over. And we, um, we don't have uh, folks who could go out and, and inspect those. And th the problem too, is that there are on private property. So, you know, we can't just um, uh, easily uh, get there uh, to, to, do, to do inspections. I, I suppose we could use drones or something, but we don't really have that uh, capability, um, even though we technically have that, um, uh, that right by, by ordinance. Um, but it has been, uh, rarely used. Uh, it, it has, it is used, um, but uh, it is, um, there, there just isn't uh, the resources to, to be able to do that. Thanks. Um, and I think that's all the questions we have for you now, um, but we may call you back up. Uh, the next question I do want to ask, uh, maybe we can uh, give this one to um, Hero. Um, Hero, there's a question from Vanessa, um, and uh, her question is, uh, you know, Ko'olauloa took a beating uh, during the recent 
uh, downpour and fire trucks, and the police had a difficult time getting to the flooded areas. Um, are there any other emergency vehicles that are lifted higher um, so that they can be available uh, during um, these types of flooding? Yeah, and it's it's always um, it's to varying degrees, right? That um, the departments and agencies are able to respond. So you know that's why we had to come up with um, additional contingency plans. Um, I think uh, really the next course of action would be the military. Um, they may have higher clearance vehicles, um, but you know, just our bar to get to um, direct assistance from military um, before it gets to a, a large scale emergency, it's, it's a really high bar. So the military often won't authorize um, the use of equipment like that until um, something really bad is happening. Um, the other thing is um, we did actually work with um, the DOT airports. Um, they have uh, specialized vehicles uh, for the airport fire response operation. So um, they may potentially have some resources that they could assist us with. But, but really, the, um, after it gets to a certain point, you know, the military, uh, whether it be the National Guard or the active duty forces, would be the appropriate resource for us. Thanks. Um, you know, and the next question, I think, uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of it in the chat is a lot of questions on uh, who owns different waterways and is there a uh, database for folks to find out uh, who owns what uh, waterway? Um, I'll pose this maybe to the elected officials, you know, and maybe all of the presenters uh, on this call. Um, but is there a database or is there a way uh, for the general public um, to find out uh, who owns what waterway um, and who may have jurisdiction on different uh, areas. Um, I'll open that to the elected officials and any of our presenters. Well, the, uh, um, oh, sorry. So quickly, I just wanted to thank Director Babcock for being on this evening with this call. Um, as Director was talking, um, through the Ko'olalo area, much of the areas that were flooded falls under state jurisdiction. So HDOT, as he mentioned, all the streams that run under the, the freeway, as we know, Waihole and Waikane and different areas that we've known have been concerns for years and years and years is under state jurisdiction. But I do appreciate Director Babcock for being here. Um, I did introduce a resolution to ask the city to really look into what we can do to maintain all things that are uh, maintained by the city. So that you'll find on resolution 21-77, which is gonna come up again at our full council meeting in April. And we're gonna add um, the list of everything owned by the city so you can see clearly. So on the city side, and again, thank you Director, Director Babcock, who's just come on board with new Mayor Blanjardi, who's already taking serious look at everything owned by the city, but we do need the state to really come to the table as much of the flooding in the Ko'olaloa area is under HDOT with the freeway. So um, I'll hand that off to Senator Revere or Representative Quinlan to address the flooding issues that happen along the Kola law areas as, as it is primarily with this state. Thank you. Sure. Um, the, yes, I think we all know DLNR was not rapidly responding um, and much of the land is state land, forestry land, conservation land. So that is a, um, it, is, it is a problem, it is a concern that we have to continue to, to go back at and look at, especially with clear eyes with this, this recent um, event. The, uh, um, Akawa stream there was uh, was a classic case where uh, right above Haula everybody's getting flooded because of all the backup of all the all the wood coming off the state lands and getting piled up and creating a, something of a dam itself and fortunately and, and mahalo to the uh, community people who stepped forward to get that out of there um, that was an impressive part just part of all the impressive actions by all the community um, so yeah, that, that, I don't have a quick answer for that. That's going to be a, uh, an ongoing struggle as um, I, I think we recognize it's a, there's a lot of land out there, uh, but there should be some sort of a maintenance program or there should be some uh, methodical planning. So uh, a good idea, Heidi, there for, for what you guys are doing. Um, I, back to the other question, how do you tell who owns the land? There is a website called gis.highcentral.com. So it's gis.hicentral.com, and it has a visualization, a mapping plan. So you can, you can look on the map, zoom around, and you can identify specific parcels, click on that parcel, and it'll tell you the ownership, 
property tax information and, and whatever else you need to know. So that's how anybody, anytime can find out um, who owns property on this island. And I'll turn it over. Sounds like Rep has a, a comment. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and thank you very much, Heidi. You know, the thing is that we have to get the city and the state and the federal government working together. I don't think it's fair to say that one particular entity or another has to solve this problem outright. Um, but we do have hopefully a lot of resources to bring to bear. And if we can get those resources working in concert, I do think that we can make big progress on some of these issues. Well, I just was bringing it up because um, I, of course we city, state and federal all has to work together. But when the issue comes as to ownership, I think that's what they were talking about. So with regard to a lot of what happened in the Ko'olaloa area, a lot of it does fall under state because we're looking at what is happening under Kamehameha Highway and the bridges. And so I guess it's as good as time as any to share that I will be introducing a resolution to ask that the state include a maintenance program for those bridges and highways in the Ko'olaloa area, because I think um, we're doing it here on the state um, city side. And thank you again to Director Babcock. We're already underway on the city side. But as you talk about in concerted effort, the state definitely also has to come on board and make a similar maintenance program there. So I will be introducing a resolution to ask um, that the state really take a concerted effort to focus on Ko'olaloa um, area with the bridges and the highway, and also to look in Haleiwa where Twin Bridges is. And so that, I think that's how the concerted effort can work. And that's why we're here for you as elected officials to make sure that we're bringing forward legislation that calls those agencies to the table to say now's the time for concerted efforts. So uh, again, we're doing it on the state uh, city side already with resolution 21-77. And I will be bringing forward one also for the state so that we can all work concertedly together. Thank you. And, you know, maybe um, I'll uh, stick with our elected officials for the next question. Um, you know, a lot of the community frustration, um, you know, has been um, on those waterways uh, that are on private property. Um, and as mentioned earlier by Director Babcock, um, there's already uh, existing city ordinance, you know, that, 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 um, is there to hold these private uh, property owners responsible. Uh, but the enforcement is uh, definitely a difficult thing to do. Um, I know Council Member Suniyoshi has, you know, is uh, looking at taking action on the city level, um, but is there um, more legislation to come um, or is there anything that you folks are uh, looking at, um, you know, to try to beef up enforcement on you know either city or state uh on private property sorry uh, but at the city at and state levels uh sure i can take that one jacob thank you um so senator riviere rep matsumoto and i introduced house resolution 81 well actually there wasn't time to introduce a fresh resolution so um, with the help of rep matayoshi of kaneohe he allowed us to take the contents of his rezo and replace it with our rezo uh, which talks about a lot of the issues that both Heidi and Gil and Hero and Luke have all talked about tonight. Better coordination between city and state, bringing more resources to bear, having stream dredging programs, um, you know, and maybe on some level, these are state funded programs using city workers. Maybe it's a mixture of both. I mean, we have to look at any options that, that we can have um, available to us. Also looking at, I don't know if, Tweaking is the right word, but taking a hard look at our emergency alert system, making sure that when folks do get those alerts, you know, they really know that, hey, it's dangerous. I don't want to talk about Haleiwa too much, but I was standing um, on the bridge of Opaiula as the stream flooded, and uh, my wife only had like 15 minutes to evacuate. That was kind of a scary thing for my family personally. Um, and listen, resos are, or resolutions, sorry, they're a starting point. It's a starting point for a conversation that's going to involve all of us, city, state, and federal, HIEMA, Department of Emergency Management, DLNR. Um, and I'm just very thankful that I have such wonderful colleagues to work with. And I think it'll be something that we'll be working on for months to come. Senator, any, any, um, any comment? So on the, the private lands, okay, the state lands, you know, yes, the state is not doing what it needs to do. And yes, there need to be more resources for that. And there have been efforts since I got into the Senate back in 2014, uh, we've been able to increase DLNR budgeting um, like by 50%. Uh, that's been one of my primary uh, initiatives and, and goals and talking points. Um, if anybody has followed 
you know, what I do at the legislature, it's always advocate for beefing up DLNR because it's so woefully um, underfunded. Um, there's a lot of people that own land. It's state, it's private land. There's a lot of private land out there. And that is going to take, that's going to be a challenge as has been implied here. Because what are we going to have? We're going to have neighbors turning in neighbors and yelling and screaming. We have problems with trees overgrowing. We know that. We know they're filling up the streams. I'm not just denying, you know, the, the, the issues there. But I do think we have to recognize that uh, the community, the individuals are going to have to step up. So maybe in our community meetings, we can have that uh, built in to uh, say, okay, what are we all doing, folks, to take care of each other? So it has to be a, a concerted effort on, on every, every level. Um, there's a question um, in the chat, um, you know, asking about the possibility of um, of improving the Waihole and Waikane Bridge. Um, do you folks know if there is any effort of being done for that? Um, so that, that watershed has been um, chronic for for as long as anyone can remember. It's been a priority for the Department of Transportation to do forever. There has been money budgeted for it forever. Um, they just can't quite pull the trigger on the Waikani one in particular. The Waihole uh, bridge is cracked, as, as many of us know. There's a big crack in it. It was deemed an emergency recently, and DOT is uh, presumably working very diligently to um, expedite the, uh, the bridge repair there. So uh, they're going at the speed of DOT. Um, and we also saw, again, mentioning the other side of the island, uh, another bridge is now closed um, due to the recent uh, flooding events. So um, now DOT uh, is aware of it, and it's something that we have worked on. I, we've all had our meetings with them and expressed our uh, passion for, for moving it along. Uh, just last week or a couple weeks ago when uh, Congressman Kahele was here, um, we toured you know, the Haliva side, Haula side, and at the end, uh, we went down and we looked at uh, the Waikani stream to try to get some federal inter interaction. Uh, the idea being if um, maybe if we can get some federal funds re released, maybe that will create some synergy for the state so that we can uh, apply federal, state, and maybe, maybe local funds to, to do some of the more expensive, dramatic stream clearings uh, that need to happen. So um, we're working on all of that. If I could briefly um, just also um, interject, today we had a committee hearing where Congressman Kahale did do a presentation on the surface transportation reauthorization and highway and transit projects. So um, working with Congressman Kahale, there is um, funding coming through and he's able to do me member designated projects. So I'm um, going to be working with talking with Congressman Kahele about Waihole and Waikane bridges as being one of those projects that we consider for federal funding. That project list is due to his office by April 7th. So um, if anybody has questions or input on um, in, um, including projects for Congressman Kahele to consider on that list, um, if you could contact my office and we can get it to them by April 7th, we're gonna be start working on it by tomorrow, but for sure Waihole and Waikane will be, um, bridges will be included in our potentials of projects that we know, like um, Senator has said, has been on the list for a long time. So that's one thing that the congressional delegation are looking for for projects that have been languishing on a list of we, we know are things that we need to do but haven't been able to do for quite some time. So I think those two are definitely projects that we can submit and should submit by April 7th. So if you have any questions about that, you can contact our office at 768-5002. And if we could real quickly um, with regards to, I see a lot of um, questions about um, the ditch along um, Wailua Beach Road um, specific TJ. We're coming out to look at that. Um, we already did talk to Director Babcock about that. so. We're, that's on our radar. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I think Councilmember Suniyoshi and Senator Rivier, um, you know, they did uh, hit on a point that now with Congressman uh, Kahele there in Congress, uh, representing District Two, he serves on the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and he also serves on the Sub uh, Committee on Highways and Transit. So that's definitely uh, a key position uh, for us here. Uh, to make sure that we get uh, the appropriate funds from the federal government uh, for these type of transportation and uh, infrastructure projects. So thank you, Councilmember, for that. 
Um, you know, the other question too, I think that I've seen uh, pop up a lot in the chat is really over the issue of climate change, you know, and, and with these storms, you know, and, and with all that's going on, you know, uh, this isn't the first and this isn't going to be the last, um, you know, so is there efforts uh, being done at the state and city level uh, to really take a hard look at this, you know, and, and, and to take into consideration the uh, impact of um, climate change? Um, I know there's definitely been a lot of climate change uh, measures moving through the legislature and even the city council. Um, but is there anything being done right now, um, you know, to address some of that? Uh, maybe we'll start with our state legislators and then we'll move back to council member Suniyoshi. Uh, sure. So um, <laughs> the answer is no, not really. We have at both the state and city levels created a lot of commissions. Um, we have created positions. We have created directors of, of various divisions that are supposed to address these climate change issues, but there really has not been um, a significant commitment to the reality of the next 30 years. And, you know, it's funny, I don't talk about it a lot when I go knock on people's doors in the community. Um, because, you know, it's kind of depressing, but I talk about it so much at work that my friends have started to make fun of me, but there's no greater challenge facing our community than climate change. Nothing, nothing, nothing else even comes close. And it's coming from both sides. It's not just the ocean. It's our rivers too. It's our watershed. Warm air holds more moisture. We're getting greater volumes of rain in shorter periods of time. Um, and, you know, this is sort of the end result. So, um, <laughs> And I've been saying for a long time that if we don't, well, when we had tourists, that if we don't spend money on preparing for climate change while we have this fantastic revenue stream of 10, 11 million visitors a year, whatever it was, um, we'll regret it one day, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Because if we reach that point where we really need federal funding, there will be a lot of other places in America that will also need federal funding. And I don't know if we'll be at the top of that list. Um, Rep, uh, since we do have you on the screen, I, I know the House uh, uh, sent over uh, HB 200, which is the state budget. Um, is there anything in the budget uh, uh, that would help, um, you know, in this type of situation uh, if it were to occur again in the future? Um, I know we have Representative Amy Peruso on and she wrote in the chat that HB 200 appropriates, I think, 30 additional do care um, officer positions to help with the uh, um, enforcement, but is there anything else uh, worth um, highlighting from that budget? Um, specifically in terms of, of climate change mitigation and ad adaptation, um, I would say no. There are some bills moving, um, you know, that are sort of chipping away at the edges of it, but what I'd really like to see happen is for us to centralize planning for climate change, whether it's rivers and streams, whether it's rising sea levels, whether it's aquifers having their freshwater lens pushed up um, by saltwater en en uh, encroachment. Um, we should centralize the planning on a statewide level, working hand in hand with our counties instead of having these silos of, you know, the county's got an office, the state has an office. Well, you know, we sort of made it to that. And in some cases we're planning for sea level rise. It depends on what department is doing what. Um, but to really have like this comprehensive commitment because it's going to cost us the, the costs. If we don't prepare now, the, the, the costs in the end will be incalculable. Thanks, Rep. Uh, we'll move on to Senator. So how about this? How about if we start taking care of our roads and as we rebuild them and we build new bridges, maybe we build them a little bit higher than we did when they first uh, went in. We do so many foolish things and we blow so much money and we never quite get there. We spend money for consultants and we come back 10 years later and we study it again. So I think as in, in addition to everything that's being said, um, let's just take care of what we can today and work towards that better tomorrow. But we gotta start somewhere and we, we keep flailing around and, and we're not doing much of anything. So that would be my <laughs> grumble on this whole subject. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Council member. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I think um, speaking about roads and bridges right now, again, going back to our um, opportunity to get some federal funds right now because of the unprecedented amount of monies and with our the congressional delegation we have and the committees that we sit, they sit on, now is a chance in a million for us to get some money to do 
the work on our um, failing infrastructure, especially on our Ko'olaloa communities where the, as we know, the highway is falling into the ocean. Basically our bridges are in, in a, as bad of shape. And really from what I saw the day when we had the flooding, I was at the Kahalu Regional Park when Kamehameha Highway got closed and to see families just stranded at a park um, parking lot is really the reality is if we have a failing Kamehameha Highway. So these are the times to look at everything what um, representative and senator was saying is to not just rebuild, but rebuild in a right way that's safer and more sustainable for the future, especially along our coastal, um, within our coastal community. So looking forward to everybody working together to make sure we utilize and make the best of the opportunity we have now for some federal funding. Um, also, I just wanted to highlight that on the, um, on the city side, we are um, doing a resiliency, um, a resiliency um, hub in Kaula which is kind of along those lines of climate change, because one of the other things that really um, was of concern to me is that when the Kamehameha Highway got shut down and there really is no um, shelters that are uh, authorized by the Red Cross to open for the um, Ko'olaloa communities that we need some type of shelter situation where the communities know where to go within their communities. So having something like a resiliency hub that and have our emergency responders really available to deal with um, the communities that are, can be underwater in a matter of minutes, as we saw this time, that we have those all those things available to us in the in the instance of a, how climate change is affecting the communities on the Windward coastline, so. Thank you. Um, maybe Senator or Rep, there is a question uh, in the chat from Kia Aloha, um, you know, asking, uh, you know, if you folks could address the collapsing road in uh, Ka'ava. Um, you know, that was a request, I uh, think that was made by the Community Association uh, back in 2020. Uh, yes, we have asked DOT repeatedly um, to go out there. Kealoha knows that I've gone out there myself um, to put up safety tape or safety, you know, the yellow safety stuff around it because it's ridiculous. You don't want kids playing around there. I mean, I, I just fear that like one day some kids are going to be walking by and part of it will just collapse over on them. Um, so we have raised this issue with DOT and we will continue to raise it with DOT until it gets fixed. And I'm really sorry that it's taken so long. It's another one of these projects where they have this thing called the uh, State Transportation Improvement Plan. And the state budgets through uh, the Oahu M Metropolitan Planning Organization budgets all of the highway projects for the next four years with two years shoulder going out beyond that. So money has been budgeted for the Ka'ava uh, shoreline and roadway uh, for as long as, uh, as we anyone can remember also. So it's, it's just part and parcel of the whole system. I would note that a couple of years ago when Crouching Lion had a, a severe impact and the road was closed, everyone will remember the, the fun it was uh, waiting to go through there. Um, that was four and a half million dollars to fix that road right there. And then immediately after that in Ka'ava, uh, further down the other end, the, um, it was 200000 to do a kind of slap job to patch it together. And then that failed, or just next to that, there was another 200000 So there's $4.9 million of emergency funds that DOT spent to shore up the road when they have hundreds of millions of dollars parked to do the projects right. So in the Ways and Means Budget Committees, when the DOT came in to ask for a special appropriation saying, we need additional money because we're running out of money. Um, that was a question I asked. I was like, you just spent 5 million bucks. Um, how much money do you have in your uh, um, Kamehameha Highways in Ka'ava section? And they said, oh, you know, 11, $12 million. I said, how long has that been on the books? And they said, oh, I said, five years, 10 years. And, and they've just said longer, longer. So. Um, I'm sorry, but that's that's. If you've dealt with DOT, uh, you, you're familiar with uh, it's it's not easy getting them to move, and that's huh, that's it. Thank you. Um, you know, I do want uh, we do have our presenters still on, so maybe if we can get any last questions for them, uh, we have Roger Babcock, uh, Hero Toya, um, and we also have uh, Carol from the Department of Land and Natural resources. So if there's any last questions for them, um, you know, please put them in the chat. Uh, if not, we'll provide some contact uh, information for them um, after this meeting. Um, in the meantime, just want to do a time check. We are at, a, at about 7.45 uh, 
p.m. Um, and for the and for this uh, next part, uh, we'll move on to our elected officials. Um, we know that the conversation so far has been centered around the floods, um, but I know they do have some updates that they want to share uh, in in regards uh, to what's going on uh, during this uh, current legislative session and what's going on at the city council. Uh, maybe so we'll start with Senator Riviere. If there was any um, other updates that you wanted uh, to share. Yeah, I'll be brief uh, and uh, allow others to maybe uh, take you know, the balance of the time. But I, um, we're, the budget has come across, that was mentioned. And so we're going to be getting a, a detailed budget briefing um, in the Senate on Thursday. So it's, um, there's a lot of money coming out of Washington, D.C. right now. One of the curious aspects of the budget is that we cannot reduce any taxes if we're going to take the money from the feds. So we got to spend it all, in other words, and we can't necessarily ease the burden on people, which I find um, a bit uh, curious. So uh, I'll be curious, I'll be taking a keen eye uh, to, to the budget. Uh, I'm not one to rapidly say we have to go out there and raise more taxes. I'm more in the camp of saying that we've got to try to um, live within our means. So I, I'm often, um, Kind of a lonely person uh, in the building um, on tax policy, but the um, I just also wanted to mention that if you haven't had enough um, of um, flood discussions and such, we're going to do another meeting uh, similar to this on Wednesday night. Um, tonight was mostly focused on uh, Ko'olalua, and on Wednesday we're going to mostly focus on uh, Haleiwa Waialua, and to talk about you know the impacts uh, over there. So we're going to do a, a similar meeting to this on Wednesday night. If you guys would like to join us at six thirty. And then tomorrow night, uh, we're going to have more time budgeted. Um, tomorrow night, I'll be giving more of a kind of a legislative briefing of, of what's going on, what bills are making. And we'll, we'll have more time because uh, we're not going to have a, 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 the flood and the emergency management experts um, um, tomorrow. So tomorrow night is focused more um, poco when, and uh, not as much flooding. Wednesday is more um, Haleiwa side and more flooding discussion. Um, and then one other comment, this is kind of a community service uh, comment. Keep the North Shore country uh, is in the Supreme Court and uh, against Napua Makani's wind farm and specifically regarding the habitat conservation plan. So keep the North Shore country will be having its day in the Supreme Court on Thursday at two o'clock. If anybody's interested in watching uh, the, the super attorneys for keep the North Shore country present the case to the Supremes that's at two o'clock. You can watch it at um, youtube.com slash Hawaii courts. And uh, I will uh, I'll pass it on to uh, my colleagues then for, for their comments. And uh, I, again, I thank everybody for being here. The strength of the community um, is undoubted. And um, I just want to thank all you guys for participating. And the answers aren't always what, um, you know, it's not easy. It's not, not like anybody can snap their fingers sometimes and make, make change happen. It takes all of us you know, to continue to work together and realize that, um, you know, people do the best that they can and we need to help them uh, do more sometimes. And we have to be part of the solution too. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Re uh, Representative Quinton. Thanks very much, Senator. And thanks for helping to set all this up. And thank you, Jacob, our excellent moderator today. Um, thanks to all our presenters too. I know that, you know, you guys probably, we prefer to be with your families on a night like tonight, but I really appreciate you coming out and speaking to our community. It means a lot. Um, so many more mahalos, all the volunteers, like guys, the way we responded as a community to this tragedy, to this event is unbelievable. Um, Huyo Haula, I love you guys, the Hui Foundation, um, Aisha, Auntie Dottie, Auntie Ella, Auntie Kella, Auntie May, um, you know, the entire Church of Latter-day Saints, I, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I got love for each and every one of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and my son just came home. So if you hear anything in the background, that's my son being fussy. Um, we already talked about the, the flood resolution uh, that Senator Riviere, Rep. Matsumoto, and myself introduced. Um, just a couple spots of good news for Kolaloa. On May 1st, and you can see it on my Facebook, we'll have a virtual groundbreaking for our new Kuhuku football field, um, which Senator and I are incredibly proud of. 
Um, it's long overdue and I'm just, I'm very happy for all the alumni and, and for all the current students that soon, um, hopefully they don't have to have graduation on a muddy field. Um, in the house CIP budget, uh, we have two very nice things. One is um, Kahana boat ramp. It's been all kinds of messed up for a long time. So the total project cost is about 2.8 million. Uh, we've got a split between state and federal money and um, it should be for the whole kit and caboodle, the parking lot, the ramp itself, the revetments, we're going to make it all look nice and brand new. So if you enjoy fishing recreationally or commercially, or you just like to go down there with your family, um, I know it's a very important resource for our side. So I'm really happy about that. And then um, if you've driven by um, Velzy Land recently, you may have noticed that the homeless encampment is looking a little less, I don't know what you'd even call it. It was kind of like a little city almost at one point. They had uh, all kinds of heavy equipment back there and cars, um, but with in conjunction with the feds, the city and state law enforcement, we finally managed to clear out most of the really bad folks from there. Um, and we got a million dollars in our CIP budget to continue to clean up um, on that piece of land. The North Shore Land Trust is taking control of the Mackay parcel, and we're going to get some dairy farming in on the Naka side just to make sure that, you know, the those uh, criminal folks don't come back because they had a chop shop and a meth lab and gosh knows what else back there. Um, and the goal really is long term to turn this into a resource for us. We can do wetland restoration, we can do lowy restoration, we can do fish pond restoration, and you know we can make it a place for all of us and make it a place that we can proudly hand off to the next generation instead of what it used to be, which was a meth lab and a chop shop. So um, just mahalo to Senator Riviere always for his support, um, House Finance Chair Sylvia Luke and um, Ways and Means Chair Donovan Dela Cruz for all their assistance with our projects. Thank you, Rep. Uh, Council Member Suniyoshi. Thank you. I did want to start by um, thanking Senator Rivera for um, coordinating this and setting this up, Representative Quinlan for being here, and um, Jacob for moderating so well, and um, also for all the presenters. And, and most of all, like Representative Quinlan, I just really wanted to send a huge thank you to you, the community, uh, because you really um, came forward in such a miraculous way throughout everything that you've been through these past um, weeks with the flooding and everything else that happened and is continuing to go on. I just wanted to say that I've, I, I am inspired by all of you and how you care for your communities and how you step up for, for your community. So I just wanted to thank all of you and um, just really wanted to say that you really inspire us to do what we do every day. So I'm happy to be here to continue to talk about things that are going on. I just wanted to highlight for the resolution 2177 that um, I had mentioned earlier that is requesting the city administration to develop a stream maintenance schedule for city owned streams and floodways that did come up in committee and was passed out committee. Now it's going to full council in April and we're gonna have amendments to that um, resolution to include um, a listing of city owned streams and floodways because we're trying to make a historical document that shows at this point in time, we're really gonna take action seriously and make sure that everyone knows where the kuleana lies and how we can coordinate and where where responsibility lies we're also going to look at doing um stream maintenance adopt a stream program with the community because as we discussed earlier the community really is able to come out in such amazing ways so look forward to working with you on the adopt a stream program because i think in so many ways the community really knows what is needed and how how to get it done so look forward to working with you on that I did include an amendment to our city budget of $5 million for an island ride program to clear the streams and floodways. So I didn't wanna just introduce a resolution that didn't have any funding attached to it. So there is a $5 million um, um, appropriation put at, in as an amendment to um, support the resolution 21-77. Um, um, I did wanna highlight um, improvements that are going on at Kahuku Police Station as we saw from, from this situation, and just as we know for our communities, our first responders are so important. So um, I just wanted to highlight some things that are going on at Kuhuku Police Station. There was the MPDS improvement to Im improve the flow of stormwater in the parking lot that has been completed. We wanted to make sure that our police station wasn't underwater in this issues of having what we had this past week. So um, that water flow improvement has been done. Ongoing, the Kahuku fire alarm system improvements is ongoing, which is going to um, help with 
fire alarm deficiencies and the fire marshal has accepted the alarm system that we are introducing for the Kuku police station. So that's being done. Upgrades at the security camera and access control system are 80% complete and awaiting a security door to complete. If you've been to the Kuku police station, there has been for a long time a need for some improvements there. So we're really happy that all these are going on. Future pr projects, we have um, upgrade to the electrical system in the ra radio room, which will support more, um, more um, support to the 911 system. And it will also affect the electrical and air conditioning system, which will also be up upgraded. And en energy services performance contract is going on with roof rooftop photovoltaic system and also build up for the front for community use. So a lot going on at the Kuhuku Police Station. I'm the chair of the Public Safety Committee and want to always make sure that our first responders are taken care yeah. of. So a lot going down at our police station in Kuhuku. We also have an appropriation for Kuhuku Park play court improvements. So we've been having um, uh, meetings with the uh, Department of Design and Construction who um, is asking that the community work with Department of Planning and um, parks and recreation for the type of play apparatus that you would like at Kuku District Park. So we'll be coming out to work with you on that. We talked about the Haula Resiliency Hub. There's a public infrastructure map resolution that's moving through council. Um, it's uh, you have to have a public infrastructure map or a PIM symbol on the property to identify that the city is um, are is uh, committed to moving forward on that um, structure. So the city is has moved forward on um, doing the PIM symbol on that property. So we are looking forward to working with the community on establishment of the resiliency hub and $2.7 million has been appropriated for the plan design and construction of that resiliency hub. Also um, with the Office of Climate Change, Resiliency and Sustainability is working with the Department of Homeland Security to develop a resiliency hub action plan. Resolution 21-76 approved the transfer of $82,000 as a local match to develop the action plan. And that really talks about Haula Resiliency Hub is, is the first of its kind for the city and county of Honolulu, which I'm very happy that it's being established in our Ko'olaloa area because of the lack of services that has been out there for that for the windward communities. And so happy that Ho'ula is the first, but this action plan is going to see where else within our Ko'olaloa communities and throughout the city that we should look at establishing resiliency hubs. So that funding has already been appropriated. So that action plan is going to be moving forward. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight the Ha'ula Hale. I just wanted to say that I've had the pleasure of working with Ha'ula Community Association on an effort to provide affordable housing for the Ha'ula community at Ha'ula Hale. Um, if you might recall, this was an issue that um, the city purchased a property that the Department of Community Service originally proposed as what was called as a clean and sober or halfway house. And um, was happy to support the Ha'ula community and the Ko'olaloa communities who said that wasn't an appropriate use for that um, property. So we are working on developing it to something that the community can be proud of and support. I also wanted to highlight that, um, as you may remember, I introduced a resolution to um, um, increase the setbacks for wind turbines to five miles. That resolution passed out of council and recently had a hearing at the Planning Commission on March 17th. At that time, the Department of um, Planning and Permitting had recommended to go from five miles to a 1,500 feet foot setback. But based on um, testimony that came from the community at that hearing at the Planning Commission, the commissioners were moved to um, feel that we had to do better than a 1,500 foot setback. So we got, uh, we got a, a continuance of 60 days. And so there will be a, um, another public hearing with the Planning Commission in 60 days to give the community time to offer an alternative um, between the 1500 foot setback and the five mile setback. So the planning commissioners are looking for um, information to see what the community is um, willing to support. There was discussions about a one mile setback that has been recognized by the, um, the World Health Organization. But please let me know and contact our office at 768-5002 with any information about your, your um, request for what the um, setback should be. 
Um, and just um, quickly, I know my time is, is up, but um, for I just wanted to talk about the city budget. I have included an, an amendment for $10 million to develop a portable housing um, project in the Ko'olaloa area. So that could be anywhere from in Kahuku. Um, we are looking at a possibility in a Kahuku for a site that has been long cited as an affordable housing, um, KBA4. And so we are now putting in the monies to make that a reality. Um, I recognize that the Ko'olaloa area has been highly underserved in terms of affordable housing projects. So we are looking to put in that money and make sure that we come out with an affordable housing project that can be um, specific for the community with mixed, mixed um, units from rentals to um, all the things that the government can do with affordable housing project that a private um, developer couldn't do. And we also put in 500,000 for planning and design of a Ko'olaloa community center. This will be an addition to the resiliency hub because we did hear a lot from the Ko'olaloa communities that of lack of a recreation center that is um, provided by the government. Um, and just real quickly, finally, the Ko'olaloa Regional Park Maintenance Facility Shed is finally underway. If you guys uh, might remember that very dilapidated uh, maintenance facility shed at Ko'olaloa Regional Park. Um, we've been noticing it for a long time, ready to just fall apart. And that um, maintenance facility services parks all the way from um, Windward and North Shore, including parks from Kualoa through Sunset Beach. So a lot of our park um, maintenance um, um, equipment was stored there. So finally, it's getting completely redone. You might notice that it's been gutted and it will be fully restored and we'll have a brand new maintenance facility there at Kualoa Regional Park. And so um, I think I did go a little bit over, but uh, that would be my report and I can um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, you know, and I do want to answer the uh, couple of questions that did come in uh, while the elected officials were giving their report. Um, so we'll uh, I'll ask these final three questions, um, and then uh, we'll close out for the for the evening. Um, the first question um, that we got uh, was uh, regarding the Kahona, the Kahana boat ramp. Uh, any idea when it's going to be fixed? Um, so the earliest that we can get the money released would probably be sometime in August. Um, and then we'll also have to work with the feds because they're contributing about 1.8 million of it. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to throw out anything I say would be a yes, but I would say the earliest would probably be next year, January, the very earliest. And I want to give an attaboy to the, uh, the, the local community that uh, just patched something up to make it useful. It was a, uh, it was outrageous every year we kept getting barred every year rep quinlan and i put in for the uh you know for the ramp we, we were every year we're making a priority and finally finally uh, our number has come up so we finally got the money secured for the ramp but to to the people that took it upon themselves to just just patch together a, a dock so that people could tie up the boat while they're while they're launching uh um good job uh, community thanks uh the second question is uh in regards to addressing the road to secret falls um and changes made uh so i guess there's uh issues with the road you know so are are there changes that's going to be made and any um improvements to fix it there was a berm built you you may people may remember that a couple of years ago there was a big berm that was built that went um kind of, you know went back about a, a half mile or mile went back there um it doesn't go far enough um, I believe uh, it, it, it did appear to be working to help keep much of the water out of Pokewai stream. Um, that flooding seems to have been reduced, but then also there was less rain in recent years. So it's, it's, it's jury still out, but it did, there was a lot of water coming down. And of course it, uh, it went around the berm and, and flooded Pokewai and, and, and parts of Haula too. So uh, that road, I don't think is the problem. I think the berm, um, does something, but the other problem is that stream has really filled in over time. There's a lot of stones and a lot of silt and a lot of stuff in there. Streams have a tendency to meander, and in modern days, we don't like that. We, you know, we have our real estate. We don't want to. We can't meander. So um, the stream um, that's that is an ongoing issue still. So um, don't have a. Good and then the last question um, is from Anthony Dottie, and is Hero still on the uh, line from Department of Emergency Management? Oh, there you are. 
Uh, this question was specifically for you. Um, and the question was, um, it, uh, can the Department of Emergency Management start uh, planning on uh, better ways to communicate with the community uh, during uh, these types of emergencies? Uh, when we implement a network of resilience hubs, these will be the communication points. Um, any response to that? Yeah, and that we're always, um, that's one of the you know, fundamental functions of our organization is to do emergency communication. So um, definitely want to uh, look at opportunities to improve. Um, of course, we have uh, multiple systems right now, um, our HNL info system, social media, wireless emergency alerts, sirens, and that sort of thing. But definitely want to work with the community to see what, um, what, what else we could do to better communicate with the public. Because ultimately, when an emergency happens, that might be the only thing that might save somebody's life is them having the right information at the right time so that they can take action. So look forward to working with Dottie and others on that. Thank you. Um, and that's going to wrap up our evening. Um, just wanted to say thank you to each and every one of you for um, joining. Um, I know we weren't able to answer every question. I did try my best. Uh, so if I didn't get to you, I apologize. It's on me. It's not on the senators or the rep or the council member. Um, but if you do have any more questions, uh, please do feel free to reach out to their offices. Um, I'll give you a head start. So if you want to take down this, these contacts, uh, get your uh, paper and pencil. Uh, for Senator Gil Riviere, you can reach out to his office at 808-586-7330. And his email is senriviere at capital.hawaii.gov. For Representative Sean uh, Quinlan, uh, you can reach out to his office uh, at 808-586-6380. And his email is repquinlan at capital.hawaii.gov. Um, and for council member Heidi Suneyoshi, um, you can reach out to her office at 808-768-5002 or email her at hsuneyoshi at honolulu.gov. Um, but just wanted to say on behalf of our elected officials, thank you uh, for Join us. Uh, we will be sending out a follow-up um, email uh, with additional information. Um, but that's a wrap for tonight's town hall. Uh, stay safe, um, and we look forward to talking to you folks soon. Aloha.